Welcome to Fixing the Money Thing. We're Gary and Dorinda Cassie, and again, we are glad to be together talking about your money. We are. Yes. Many times we think that what we have is not going to make it for us. It's not going to do anything. When we're in financial trouble, I know it's, back when yeah. we were struggling financially, yeah, yeah. it seemed like we really had nothing to work it with. It seemed that way, always yes. something, isn't there? There always is something. Today we're going to talk about that. So many emails we get, people go, I'm hopeless, I don't mm -hmm. see any potential, but Drenda, there always is that potential because everyone yes. is made unique, and it is that uniqueness that is valuable, and the world tells you that you need to be common, but your uniqueness is the key to your future. You just need to see it. Today, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about you and helping you see how special you've been made, which is a key to your future. Gold mining was once second only to agriculture as North Carolina's most important industry. It all started back in 1799, just as the United States of America was young and growing, that a large gold nugget was discovered on the Cabarrus County farm of John Reed, a former Hessian soldier. For three years, the chunk of rock was unidentified and used as a doorstop in Reed's home. A jeweler from Charlotte recognized the rock for what it was, a 17-pound gold nugget worth approximately $3,600 at the time. John Reed agreed to sell the nugget for $3.50. It has been said that Reed later received an additional $1,000 for his error. In a short time, many more nuggets were found on the Reed farm, one weighing 28 pounds. After finding all the surface gold, Reed and his new partners James Love and Martin Pfeiffer opened a mine. It is estimated that more than $10 million in gold was taken from the Reed farm alone. But it all started with a heavy but unnoticed doorstop. We love getting your emails, your questions. Here's an email from someone who says, uh, someone gave me a set of your early CDs and they sat in my to-do stack on my desk for nearly two years. Mm -hmm. My wife saw them, listened to them and loved the series. Eventually, she got me to listen to them with her. While we were not in debt and our house is paid for, she wanted a newer car, so we decided to sow a seed of $150 toward a very specific newer car. In less than 10 days, we received a totally unexpected notification that we had been underpaid an amount equal to nearly 20 times the amount we sowed. It was our first taste and a new beginning of the kingdom. What's interesting, Gary, is these CDs were in their house. You know, today we're talking about yes. what's yeah. in your house. And these were all, all along sitting in the house. And he goes on to share how they did a Bible study, shared this with uh, 30, 40 people in their church, and how they have all these testimonies. They go on and on about awesome. uh, new jobs and situations. But all along, the key was sitting right there yes. in his uh, stack of yeah. to-do things. And so many right. times, what we need is right in our house, isn't it? Amen. It's right in the house, but we're not seeing it. You can be sure of this. God is always trying to get his word to you in these kind of situations. It's always there if you can just see it. And so, you know, the story we just saw, these guys were tripping over this 17-pound gold nugget. Yeah. Can you imagine that? Scrambling to buy groceries, trying to survive, and here they got this gold oh, sitting there. it was in there. their house. Yeah, it's in their house. And uh, so that's what we're talking about today. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 4. Let's go over to the screen here. And let's talk about what's in your house. Before you answer the question, though, let's, let's wait to the end of the show. Get your pencil and paper out. Let's follow along here. Get your Bible. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets, this is 2 Kings chapter 4, cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead. You know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. That's a tough situation. I mean, her whole life is now, you know, it's foreclosure time. All right, Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Now, I want you to underline that word in your Bible, how can I help you? Now, notice in those days, they weren't born again, so they came to the prophet to receive direction from the Lord. So he says, how? Now, this is, if you catch this, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? So, Drain, here's a rule we need to mark. God can only work with what's under our legal jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. All right? 
which in this case looks like it's pretty slim, right? right and we may be looking, house. yeah, and people watching today may say, well, that's good. Yeah, I'd like you to find something in my house. I guarantee you, it wasn't any worse in this situation. So what do you have in your house? Notice how he says, how can I help you? My ability to help you is limited to what you have under your legal jurisdiction. Something you do, something you have, Obviously, you're not seeing it like this couple with that 17-pound gold nugget. They didn't see it, but God knows where it's at. It may be a skill. It may be your uniqueness. It may be something that's hidden, but God wants to show you what it is, okay? What's in your house? Your servant has how much? Nothing. <laughs> it's, isn't that? There, I, no, she emphasizes this. There is nothing there at all. I like how she emphasizes. It's like, you're nuts. What do you mean? That's why I've come to you. What do you mean? There's nothing. I just came to you. They're going to take my boys away. Don't you think I would have exhausted my resources to keep my boys? I mean, come on, prophet. You know, I need, I need God and I need to hear God. All right? Mm. I have nothing at all. That may be what you're saying. We, we, we found that out. We didn't have anything. Except... A small jar of olive oil. Wow. And he goes on and says, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside, shut the door behind you and your sons, pour oil into the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. Of course, you know the story. The jars filled and filled until they ran out of jars. The question I ask you, Drenda, what's in our house? She didn't see it at all. She was actually offended by the question. You know, what do you mean? What's in my house? But see, God used what she had, that little bit of olive oil, to turn it into her future. She literally became an oil tycoon. The Bible goes on and says to her, the prophet said, after the oil multiplied, go sell the oil and live on the rest. Go sell the oil means to engage in commerce, marketplace, change the oil to the money that you need, mm. change what you have, and God has touched to what you need. Do you follow that formula? Yes, yes. Take what you have, get God involved with it. It converts to the money that you need, and that changes your life. Good, excellent. Now, when we were destitute for nine years. Yes. I was just thinking about that story. There was a point where I remember my mom calling and mm -hmm. saying, how are things? And I said, they're fine. <laughs> and she said, open the refrigerator, and what do you see? And I said, nothing except an empty jar of mayonnaise. And I started to cry yeah. because, you know, the, the refrigerator was empty, but I yeah. kept the jar of mayonnaise in there just because it looked like there was something in there then, you know. But we yeah. did have some things that God could use. We did. It wasn't but what we had, <laughs> what we had was failing. Yes. Everything, it was, it was failing. We were, we were destitute. And this wasn't like a short period of time. This is nine years. Mm -hmm. We were struggling just to survive. Struggling. So... We began to get a hold of the kingdom of God, actually how the kingdom operates, how God legally gets involved with our stuff. Like the story, what do you have? She got direction by the, by the prophet, go get jars. She got a plan given to her by the prophet. God gave a you know, plan through the prophet to her, and God got involved with that situation and changed it. So when we got a hold of the kingdom and began to apply kingdom law to the nothing that we thought we had, we, at least I was, surprised of what God said do. He said to us in a dream, take your failing business and change it and put it in my hands. Let me say it again. I was involved in sales. I was involved in insurance sales and different areas of financial sales, and we were, yeah. we were starving. Okay. Mm -hmm. In the dream he gave me, when we began to apply kingdom law, he showed me a picture of the business we had changing its purpose and being a purposed company for the kingdom of God. Yes. Instead of looking at that business as a method to make money to survive, we looked at that business as a means of touching the culture for the kingdom's purpose, mm. and money then came out of that. When we got the dream, he took that broken business, but he took our experience Although we were failing, we had some experience with the financial services industry. So he didn't take me out of that field. He just changed it. He just did some changing with what I had, and we created a brand new company which prospered and amazingly paid all of our debt off, 
provided cash flow that enabled us to pay cash for our land, you know, our house we're building, things that were going on. And still today, 30 years, 20, I guess 25 years later, still producing hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And we're able to fund kingdom And we business. fund kingdom assignments you know, with it's that so business. It's exciting because it was, yeah. all the, it was there all along. It was. The ability, the business, and the experiences. But when we yeah. brought it to God and gave it into the kingdom and we started utilizing our business to fund kingdom vision, that's when everything changed. It was an amazing transformation, but it took God's, I had to get to the place, you remember, I mean, we were, we were like crying out to God. It's like, we were Christians the whole nine years. Something was wrong. I mean, we knew that something was wrong. So we began to cry out to God and he gave us a plan through a dream and changed our situation. You're watching Fixing the Money Thing. So what is faith? Your faith has healed you. Well, I want, I want to be healed. What is faith? How do, you know, what is faith? I got to know what that is. Christians use the word faith like it's water. Most of the time, they have no clue what it is or if they're in faith. That's not being negative. That's just being, because if, it was, if they were truly in faith, you'd see all kinds of mind, signs and wonders. That would happen, right? Because the word of God doesn't lie. All right, so. We understand, though, that if there's a short circuit in, in the words of God, it's always on this end. You understand that? God never lies. Power's always on. If there's a short circuit, the switch isn't turned on. We always examine that. If you, do, if you leave the conference and you only get one thing out of it, remember that. All right. Romans chapter 4, verse 19. We're looking for some clues here of what it means to be in faith so we can know how to turn the switch on. Romans chapter 4, verse number 19. Without, this is speaking of Abraham now, without weakening in his faith, there's that word, but it doesn't give us any definition. He faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. Still no definition of faith there. Being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Well, there's faith. Faith is being in agreement with what heaven says. Being fully persuaded of what God says. When you are fully persuaded of what God says, you're in agreement with heaven. That's called faith. All right, that's called faith. Fully persuaded. Why is faith necessary? Why can't God just heal whoever and everyone? You should be able to answer that by now. Don't have jurisdiction. Who, who had authority over the earth realm? Adam did, men do. Men are the, still the only legal entity on the earth realm. God gave the earth to men and women. And so... As we found out, God couldn't just come busting in here. He had to go through a door, just like Satan did. He had to go through a, someone living on the earth and fully persuaded of what heaven said. That was Abraham. It said even though he understood the fact that they are way too old for babies, he was fully persuaded of what God said. He, was, he had faith. All right. And that faith is what God used to open that door, it made it legal, because now heaven had legal jurisdiction to invade the earth realm through Abraham. Are you got it? Yes. All right. Luke chapter four, verse five and six, this is when the devil was tempting Jesus. Uh, he showed Jesus in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their what? Authority and splendor, wealth. For it has been given to me. Who gave it to him? Adam did. All right. So in Mark chapter six, we find, let me ask you a question. If uh, you ask someone on the street, if Jesus could heal people, anyone he wanted to, they would probably say what? Oh yeah, he's Jesus. And what would you say if I said he couldn't? Oh, I, I tried that one time. I had, I, had, I had a speaker lined up to come and speak at a provision conference. Very talented lady in business. And she got a hold of my teaching. And when she heard me say that, what I just told you that Jesus couldn't do some things and that faith was required. She called me, so I'm canceling, I'm not coming. I said, why not? She says, I don't believe what you said. I don't believe like that. 
I said, well, it's right there in the word. She said, I'm not going to argue with you. I don't believe that. That's not true. I said, right there in the word. She didn't come. Because most of the church believes that. They believe that. They don't understand jurisdiction. They don't understand what faith is and why it's required. We know that faith's required because God cannot invade the earth realm. It's been given to men and women, right? And the only way he can legally bring his power here is if someone who owns legal jurisdiction on the earth allows or invites that authority to flow through them in the earth realm. Being in agreement with heaven, fully persuaded, God can then, being in faith, gives heaven legal jurisdiction through you. Not everyone, but through you. Mark chapter 6 says Jesus could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on sick, few, a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of what? Faith. faith. Why couldn't he heal them? Heaven had no jurisdiction. Unbelief. Heaven had no jurisdiction. Now, heaven had no jurisdiction. So let's look at Romans 10.10. 10. This is how you receive salvation. The Bible says, you believed in your heart and you were justified. Now there's that term again. We said last time we mentioned the word justified or justice. What did it mean? It's a legal term, meaning administration of law. So you believe in your heart, meaning fully persuaded of what heaven says. Your heart is fully persuaded and you're justified. What does that mean? It means it's now legal for heaven to invade earth through you. But nothing happens. Just like the power lines are on at your house. Paid your bill, power's there, but not on in your house. You gotta flip the switch. So you believe in your heart and now it's legal. You're justified, then what does it say? It's one sentence. And you confess unto salvation. See, because you have jurisdiction on the earth realm, you have to release that authority. Are you following me? You're the one that has jurisdiction. The power lines are on. It's, you're justified by believing what heaven says, but still nothing happens until you actually release that power, that authority into the earth realm. You got it? Okay. Getting it there. Okay. That's remin- so uh, the heart of man or woman is the interface of heaven and earth. You write that down. Your heart, everything heaven does will go through your heart, your belief system. Either you're going to be persuaded of what heaven says or you're going to be in fear, but heaven cannot move until you are fully persuaded. Everything you receive, everything that heaven says is yours, every promise has to go through that process. Amen. So we have a problem. We've been trained for 30, 40 years in an environment of fear. We've been trained for 30 or 40 years not to believe what God says. I mean, I can't mentally say, okay, Gary, I'm going to believe what God says. People try that. They walk up to you and say, oh, you have a cold? Let me pray for you. And they have no more faith that you'll be healed than anything else. They do it out of religious duty or just religious habit. I know I'm kind of treading on thin ice there. I'd rather tread on thin ice and shallow water than deep water, wouldn't you? Okay, so we need to define what fully persuaded is. And there's a real little exercise I like to do to help you figure that out. I'm going to find a color. Okay, these lights up here, these green lights all around here, green lights. Now, if I said they were green, what would you say? And if I said, you're crazy, they're green. Back when the Crayola Company was formed, the owner of that company hated red and called it green. And ever since they made crayons, that's what was been taught in the public school system. And that they, that color was originally green. What would you say? What would you say? Who's the, who would say, who's the crazy one? You would say, you're the one that's crazy, right? Why? Because you're fully persuaded that's, that's red. Are you not? How many... Do, are you emotionally bothered by that? If I said, I mean, you're convinced it's red. You're not bothered. If I said anything, you got, it bounces off you, doesn't it? You're fully persuaded. You're fully persuaded that gravity is going to hold you to that chair. Fully persuaded. Now being fully, pers- that's what it feels like. When you're in faith, it's like that is red. 
you have cancer, you're gonna die. That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. That is red, it's red. You're gonna die broke, that's red. That is not even possible. I don't even entertain it. I don't even pick the thought up because the shield of faith, shield of faith being fully persuaded, it just bounces off. It doesn't even come into your mental ascent. It does, it's a shield's outside your body. It's, it's out here. The shield quenches every fiery dart. It doesn't even enter into your mental thoughts. You reject it. Just does, it just bounces off. Now, if it doesn't bounce off, guess what? You're not in faith. Now we realize, wow, a lot of the times I'm not in faith. A lot of times I'm trying to pray the prayer, prayer of faith while I'm in fear. Hello? Praying the prayer of faith while you're in fear doesn't work because you can't have fear and faith operating together. And you're going to find, quite frankly, many, many, many times you'll find you're not in faith. So what do you do about it? You got to know how to handle that. Okay? So how do I get in faith then? Okay, so now I realize I'm not in faith. I'm, I'm, I'm meditating more on what could go wrong than what could go right. I'm thinking, of, I'm thinking of the earth curse system. I'm not meditating on the promises that, yes and amen, praise God, that's mine. Instead, I'm going, oh, well, you know, you're, you're thinking all the negative side of things. And it happens subtly, friend. I was just telling our team back there, you know, I know there are a lot of you who have been to these conferences before, heard the same teaching. You know what? It's been a while. You know what? You're listening to something every day. And with you realizing it or not, you are being slowly transformed by what you hear and meditate on. And it's vital that you meditate on the promises and what the kingdom says. Welcome to Fixing the Money Thing. I'm Gary Cassie. And I'm Drenda Cassie. You know, Gary, there was a time we didn't believe we could get out of debt either. Uh-uh, no way. We used to buy everything on payments. Yep. And, uh, you know, I think most people are raised with that attitude of if you want something, you're just going to put it on payments. Today, we do not, we don't even think payments, do we? No, we That's not even in our vocabulary to think. No, we don't. Oh, it's only going to be $500 a month or $200 a month. You know, Dorinda, let's take a moment and, and catch them up to speed where we really were. Yeah, 25 I mean, years ago, it wasn't too pretty. It wasn't pretty at all. In fact, uh, basically, everything broke and everything used. Little farmhouse, every car we had, 200,000 miles. Hope that it started. I mean, uh, you remember the broken window frames, the old farmhouse? I mean, it still had the wavy glass. I mean, this farmhouse hadn't been remodeled mm -hmm. since the 1800s. And no, no heat upstairs. No heat upstairs. But it was a fixer upper. We drove a used car until it would drive no more. Yeah, and we did yeah. make a commitment. But it seemed like for a while there, the harder we tried to get out of debt, the further we got behind. Right. And right. Uh, it seemed impossible it seemed until impossible. we got a hold of some things that made a difference. Well, it came. Everything got worse and worse and worse till we exhausted every bit of credit. We've already borrowed tens of thousands of dollars <laughs> from relatives, and we were basically hopeless. But we were already Christians. I know you're thinking, well, you need to get, you know, know the mm -hmm. Lord and come to church. But we already were in church. In fact, we were active in church, leading worship in church, and loved God. But yet we are moving backwards, and we have found, Dorinda, that so many Christians have lived yes. just like that. What's the answer? It's found in Luke chapter 6, verse number 20. Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. How we discovered that? Oh, let's take a look at a session we recently taught at Faith Life Church where we examine that very question, and you'll find out. An attorney called, one of many, that called and said, we're filing a lawsuit against you for one of my clients. This was not out of the ordinary, but on this particular day, there was nothing left. Every credit card, every option, even my dad said he was tired of loaning me money. Everything was closed down. And so when he called, I went upstairs to my bedroom and laid across the bed and cried out to God because I knew I needed help. God spoke to me instantly. I thought that was amazing. I remember thinking it was amazing then in that day. And he simply gave me this scripture, Philippians 4.19, and my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus, or it means the kingdom. I said, I don't, I've heard that scripture a million times, but I don't have that. Why not? He answered quickly again. He says, because you've never learned how my kingdom operates. 
Now, I didn't know what that meant, and that was the first time I heard the term kingdom. What does that mean? I didn't know what that meant. I ran downstairs, grabbed Drinda's hand, said, Drinda, God spoke to me. I apologized to her. We repented. I can remember the exact spot. We prayed. We had no idea what we were going to do. This attorney had called. We had nothing but God teach us the kingdom. All right? Well, at the time, for your amazing kind of information, I was teaching people how to work with their finances. Isn't that interesting? I was selling insurance and securities. And so in those days, we all, I was always happy our cars started because to me, I did believe in a God because they started. It was a miracle every day. <laughs> I'm just kidding. They were in bad shape. So when on appointment, the next day I had an appointment. On appointments, I had a strategy. I would park my van around the block because let's put yourself in their shoes. You're talking to me about investing a half million dollars. You look out in the driveway and there's this beat up, falling apart, no wheels match van. And when I started, it puffs and smokes and fills your driveway with smoke. Wouldn't you assume if you are so smart in finances telling me how to do it, wouldn't you apply it to your own life? Isn't that a, wouldn't you assume that? So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm smart enough to figure that out. So I park around the block and I would always walk to the client's house. But this guy followed me out. Remember, this is the day after this thing happened. He followed me. He's a talker. He followed me down the street. I thought, you know, he wouldn't go that far, but he did. And came to the van. And so I decided he'd wear himself out after a while, but he didn't. So I got in the car. I had to be somewhere else. So I got in the car and finally, reluctantly, I started the car. I knew what would happen. And it did. The whole driveway filled with smoke. And he went... Shut it off. Shut it off. I said, right, okay. He comes up to the window and says, I'm a mechanic. Part-time, I'm a mechanic. Let me check your engine. So he popped the hood. He comes back and says, you have a broken head gasket. Just drive it home. Don't drive it, you know, everywhere. Just drive it home. Get it fixed. You'll be fine. That's not really what I wanted to hear because people that have no money, a head gasket's like a major event, right? And so on the way home, from that appointment, I began to talk to God because we just had committed ourselves to learn the kingdom. Didn't know what that meant. I said, God, I can't sell this car broken. I can't pay it off. I can't sell it broken. I don't know what to do with this car. Maybe it'd be better if it just burned up and the insurance company pay it off and I'd be rid of it. When I said that, I was driving and I noticed on the hood just a little speck of paint, that just a little bubble. And for some reason, I remember thinking, I don't remember that bubble there before. But the thing that caught my attention was the bubble was getting bigger as I drove. And it eventually got the size of my hand. The paint was bubbled. And I thought, that is definitely not normal. <laughs> as I pulled into my office, as the wheels touched the berm, you know, the, the little road as you turn into the driveway of the office, bam, the whole thing burst into flames six to eight foot high off the engine. Think of all the years of the oil leaking from that head gasket, coating that engine. Now all that oil is inflamed and that fire, that black smoke, just that thing is on fire. Yes. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I mean, put yourself in my shoes. I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. I set it and there it's burning up. Can you, can you imagine that? The firehouse was just five houses down the street. So I called them even though, you know, I didn't really want to put it out too soon. They come down there, of course, by that time it's all just smoldering. The captain walks up and says, man, I'm really sorry, Gary, about your car. I knew I had to act at that moment. Yes, seriously. <laughs> but inside I was happy. It's like, wow, I mean, wow. I mean, it really burned up. I mean, it really burned up. I just really couldn't hardly con conceive of that, you know. I called the insurance guy the next day and they they paid it off. They offered me a price, and I read the policy. And I said, in small print, I saw this. It says, if it burns by fire, there's no deductible. I called him back, and I said, uh, you missed something. <laughs> no deductible. He goes, I hear the keypad. You know, you're right. I'm sorry I missed that. $500 more. Anyway, so he paid the van off, paid the bill, overnighted the check to the attorney on time, and then, you know, paid some other bills. We were ecstatic until we sat there that night realizing we don't have a car. <laughs> My dad heard of this and he called me and he said, let's go look for a van. My dad's a very generous person. I thought possibly he might buy us one. So we went and looked and he said, I'll give you $5,000 towards the down payment. You pay the rest. I'll co-sign for you. He knew, the, he knew my credit was bad. I'll co-sign for you. And I thought, 
that's pretty fair, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's pretty, pretty good deal. In front of my dad, I didn't want to, I didn't know what to do in front of my dad. He was being very generous, so I went ahead and filled the form out. I didn't know, I was kind of torn up on the inside because we just made a decision not to use debt like that. Of course, they called and it was approved, come pick your van up in the morning. So during the night that night, thank God for wives. I mean, I was already torn up. She said, Gary, you know we can't do that. So I called the guy and canceled the, the van. When we did that, we had to take our stand, took our stand. A guy called Drenda that she had met several months before because her parents sold antiques. He called her and said, you know, I run this nursing home. We have three rooms of furniture that we have, we have to get rid of. Do you know, are you interested in looking at any of it? Her parents sold furniture, did antiques in Georgia. She calls them. We shipped it down there. They sold it and they gave us, bought us a station wagon. I was in a car that was paid for. So I was now getting a picture of how the kingdom operates. Well, that was quite the story, especially at the beginning of understanding kingdom. We kind of shook our heads and God teach us how this thing operates. You know, interesting, God provided a car for us and then we began to save money. And within a year, we actually saved enough money to pay cash for the car we really wanted to buy. That's right. And it was the beginning of a journey with the kingdom that changed everything. Yes, it was. You know, faith with patience is how we inherit the mm -hmm. kingdom. That's what the Bible says. But typically we want to do credit card with begging God to help us pay it off. Yeah. And God's that's true. saying, no, be patient and let me show you by faith how to do it. what's in the kingdom, how to get it out of the kingdom. Yep. And when we did that, it, it did. It set our, us on a different course. When people go into different debt for course. a house and a car, they're set on a course to stay in debt the rest of their life if they don't do well, something the, different. It, the Bible says that when you borrow money, you become a slave to the lender. Mm -hmm. And that's not a good place to be. I mean, there are places and times for temporary debt. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the lifestyle of living in debt by debt. And that's what God had to teach us. There's another whole way of operating, another whole kingdom that operates. And that story was exciting, but the stories that followed that story got more exciting and more exciting and they happened more yes. frequently. And our lives literally changed and we were excited about it. So today we're talking about where do I start? How do I get started in this process of getting out of debt? And we're going to take a look at some information that'll help you. I'll be right back with that answer. We have been wanting to get out of debt. You know, that's the biggest thing. We've been praying about it for a long time. And then, um, you know, we've been coming to conferences and uh, so when we heard about the financial freedom. We took the, the course and, uh, you know, did the little booklet, you know, look, how can you save here, save there? And it was just those little fragments, just, you know, the things that you don't think really mean anything. You know, the $20 here, the $50 there. And I felt like when we, once we leaned into that we're gonna do it, all of a sudden, man, things started happening. You know, we hear the stories, even uh, Pastor Gary and Drenda, there's stories of, you know, looking for change. <laughs> We've been there. Yeah. The pain of that. I remember one evening you were in the garage. I was and peeling copper, selling he copper was, to try to pay He had an old bills. construction cord and he was, I was like, what are you doing? And it was taking him <laughs> forever and he's stripping, he was like, we need some money. I, I need this copper out of this it. old cord. And, you know, just those moments were so painful, you know. Hearing Pastor Gary talk about, you know, the little fragments and look around. What can you sell? What can you sell? We don't have nothing to sell. What do we have? We don't have anything. Well, we had this land in the back that was landlocked. So We could only sell it to one person, basically, the neighbor. We, we went back and forth and... It, it wasn't feasible for us to sell it at the time with the price that he wanted. And I was kind of almost begging him to take it just to help, you know, ease some of the credit uh, pain. So anyway, we forgot about it. We sowed a seed. We, God gave us the plan. Next thing you know, he comes back and offers us double. And we were like, you know, I, I couldn't show all my excitement. I kind of held it in a little bit. I said, <laughs> oh, let me think about it. Anyway, long story short, we closed the deal. We we was with selling a portion of our of our land. We still have you know a little bit of land left in uh, our house. I think once you just lean into it, you make that decision to to declare you're going to get out of debt. 
God begins to open doors. They said it was like five to seven years. We said, I looked at her and I said, well, we're gonna be out of debt in one year. And um, this year, we were out of debt. You know, we, we paid our house off, we paid our truck yeah. off, we helped our kids with college. And when, like I said, when I looked at her and I said, we will be out of debt in one year. I felt faith, I felt belief, I felt confident. Like, we could do this, you know? And we did it. When you're used to uh, thinking like the world thinks, that world system on trying to work and get money and so you can you know, do what you need to do to get out of debt and all these things, it never works. But just following the principles of what we've learned here at Faith Life, God gave us a plan and it was just, it was like an easy lean into and just following the guidelines of the plans of what God had for us and uh, he did it for us. I think when we came home and we pulled into the house, knowing that it's our home now, debt free, you know, that no one could take it, it's ours. We were just so grateful. You know, we, we gathered our, our adult children, you know, they're in college. We got them, we got together and we just prayed and just thanked the Lord for, for what he's done for us, you know, and that this really is, um, living a good life and he has it for everybody. And we're, we're just truly blessed and just happy, you know, living that happy life, you know, the good life. Now we could build wealth, you know, before it was just pay bills. You know, now it's like, okay, now. Now, what did God have for us? We're not bound to anything. You know, we have that freedom to go forward and, and see what the Lord has for us to, uh, you know, for his kingdom. And to now to be able to save the debt free. It just feels so good. And we know others, other people can obtain that too. This is the why behind what we do. We remember what it was like to be financially in a difficult place, to struggle, to not know where our next paycheck was going to come from and what we were going to do. But we put together all of the tools we feel like you will need to be able to get started and finish to finally get out of debt. It's an awesome feeling. God wants you to have that freedom in your life so you can do what he's called you to do and you can fund his kingdom instead of letting the enemy steal from yours. Gary, let's get started. How do we start this process oh, yeah. to get out of debt? All right, there's two sides of getting out of debt. We have the, the spiritual, the kingdom side, and the natural side. Now, we just mentioned the kingdom side, and certainly we need to study that as well. But today, let's focus on the natural side. we got to do our part. The mm -hmm. first step in getting out of debt is knowing how much you owe. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how many people put their bills in a drawer, especially when money's tight. They don't want to look at them. Sure. And they just compile in there and build up sure. in there. And if I ask them, how much do you owe, they couldn't answer. Most of the time, they buy things based on, can I afford the payment? It's just That's one right. more payment, adding the payments, but That's they right. really have no clue what they really owe. And they don't count loans to, to Uncle Joe, 0% interest or different things. They don't count that as a debt. I wanna know everything you owe. So here's your first assignment. Go to the bill drawer, be brave, and <laughs> dump it on the floor. Every scrap piece of paper, anyone you owe, a student loan, a dentist, you know, braces, your parents, whoever, I want you to make a list of everyone you owe and come up with a number. Don't let the number scare you because we're going to get rid of the number, but you've got to face the facts to know what you're going to believe God for. That's number one. Mm -hmm. All right? What's next? Number two is I'm going to ask you to make a budget. Now, I know it's not a pretty picture, so don't get embarrassed by that. And you're probably negative. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for exactly how much are you negative. You know, interesting, Drenda, when you ask people if they have a sound budget, they usually can't answer the credit card has done away with the budget, meaning that when people are shopping, they don't stop shopping when they're out of money. They keep shopping because they have credit cards. They don't, they don't really even know the end of their budget. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They don't even know I have $200 as to spare. As long as there's room left on the credit card. As long as they, they just keep going along and then they keep racking up debt. So here's your assignment. Do not make a pretty budget. In other words, I'm not asking you to think, okay, we can live on this, 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 and make a budget. I want you to go back three months and account for all the money you've spent. I want to know how much you were negative the last three months. Not going forward, we're trying to find a number, and that is how negative is your budget? And it's going to shock you. You may think, well, I'm $100. You may find you're $800, but that's the point. 
we got to find out and we've got to stop that negative slide. Mm, good. What's next? Then? Okay. Cash reserve. You probably don't have one. You may have a few hundred dollars, but that's the point. We've got to have one. I want you to list how much you have. If you have a hundred dollars, write it down. All right, so we have to do two things right now, Drinda. Above anything else, we have to balance your budget first, cash reserve second. Those two things have to be done before we ever think about getting out of debt. We have to balance the budget to avoid sliding into further debt. We have to have a cash reserve to stop us from having to use debt to fix small emergencies like a set of tires or whatever we need at least $2,000, preferably $5,000 in a cash reserve. And you may be thinking, I, that's huge. I don't have that money. I'm going to suggest they might. We're going to show you how to find that and get it done. All right, so now we have to find money. So we're going to assume your budget's negative and you have no cash reserve. A pretty typical situation in America, I think, probably. Well, actually, statistically, 50% of Americans are not even making their minimum payment on their credit cards. Mm, wow. 50% wow. can barely make that. So they're borrowing that minimum payment. They're going further in debt every month. So we it's have a negative spiral. It's, it's just a bad situation in America. People live on debt. Okay, so now we got to find money. How can we find money to get you up to speed? So here's your next assignment. I want you to go through all the things you buy and what can you get rid of. I'm talking about things that cost you monthly, like a cable satellite bill a health club membership, um, some kind of program that you're paying monthly on it, you're going to have to help me here. You've got to think of ways to cut expenses, all right? They can get creative ways to save money that are huge. That's right. These are non-essential things that you can creatively think of cutting back to free money up into your budget. Now, I know people are thinking, well, we don't want to live that way. Well, it's temporary. Freedom is yes. worth it, so please yes, bear with us. Okay, the second way to find money is to sell something. All right, most people, if you go to their garage, they have garage sales and things, go to their garage or their basement, you're going to find a bunch of stuff. Okay, mm -hmm. now we need to hold either garage sales, eBay, Craigslist. The bottom line is we've got to find the cash reserve by selling things if we can't. And then we, got, we need to also find other things we can sell, like maybe the second car, motorcycle, boat, RV, things that are not essential to your life that you can sell that will eliminate a payment. So again, we're all about trying to find money at this point, just right. trying to find money. What can I sell? What can and I list? It's not that you can't have those things. No. You need to have them when you're out of debt. That's right. We have a saying, when we were getting out of debt, we had a saying that says they... Yes, they still make it. Still make them. You can still get it. And it's a lot... You'll enjoy it a lot more when it is cash and, and you're you not pay strapped. for it. Yeah, not strapped, and you are enjoying it. Then life is a whole different right. way of living, and that's awesome. And yes, Drenda, in our experience, the average person can, can be out of debt in five to seven years, including their mortgage, yes. without changing their income. That is an amazing statement to make, but let us prove it to you. And that's what we want to do here on Fixing the Money Thing. That's right. You know, Gary... Through the years you've been helping people with their finances, over 30 years, how, I guess, what is the biggest amount you've seen someone be able to save in a month that thought they were strapped and going to lose everything? What was the biggest well, amount of money? I don't know about how much to save in a month. I mean, at the largest, I saw a guy with $230,000 in credit card balance, just credit wow. card balance. Wow. You know, pay all that all off. I mean, obviously, there's been great stories, but typically this process takes more than just one month. You know, we have to walk it out over a few months to get everything right. working. But I know we found people that were strapped that thought they had no extra money, and we oh, found yeah. $1,000 a month extra. Oh, yeah. Extra. The average, okay, I see what you're asking. The average, when we try to find money and we'll go through our process, the average is 500 to about $1,300 a month in people's cash flow when we finished financial restructuring and actually get things rearranged. And these are people that thought, no, Gary, I have no extra money. Right. I'm negative every month. Yep. But you found 500 we, to $1,300. Yep, yep. Almost without exception, we so, find that every time, and that's what we looking. use to get out of debt. Definitely. So, Definitely. Anyway, jump on, get involved, go to GaryXeed.com and get on board. Yes. It's an awesome, yes. awesome thing There's to do. There's more than hope. There's a plan to get it done. That's right. We're going to show you how you can get it done. That's right. Let's take a look at how to get this information right now.